The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. At that time, the two disciples told what had happened on the road and how Jesus was known to them in the breaking of the bread. As they were saying this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace to you. But they were startled and frightened, and they supposed that they were seeing a ghost. Again he said to them, Why are you troubled, and why do questionings rise in your hearts? See my hands and my feet, that it is I indeed. Handle me and see, for a spirit has not flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they still disbelieved for joy and wondered, he said to them, Have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate before them. Then he said to them, These are my words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures, and he said to them, Thus it is written, that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be preached in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. The Gospel of the Lord. Lead questions for today. Question number one. What would you consider the principal theme of the readings of today? I said that because there are a number of themes that suggest themselves. So what would you consider the principal theme? Question two. State in one sentence only the key message of St. Peter in our first reading, Acts of Apostles, chapter 3, verse 13 to 19. What is his key message? Question 3. Why do you think the disciples found it difficult to recognize Jesus immediately after the resurrection? And what finally helped them to recognize him? Why did they find it difficult to recognize him soon after the resurrection? And what finally, eventually, helped them to recognize him? Question 4. St. John writes in 1 John chapter 2, verse 1 to 5, which we had as our second reading, Anyone who says he knows God and does not keep his commandment, na lie. He is a liar. He does not know God. He says, if you know God, you will keep his commandments. And he says that the commandments for those who know God, for those who love him, the commandments are not difficult. So if you are finding the commandments so difficult, the question is, whether you know God. Now, what does this mean for us Nigerian Christians today? Yes, I can I... I want to answer question four. Yes. 
St. John writes, anyone who says he knows God and does not keep his commandments is a liar. What does this mean for us Nigerian Christians today? This means that for us Nigerians who claim to know God but engage in sins, it means that we are practically telling lies that we know God. So Nigerians, including people sitting in front of you and behind you and on your side, Nigerians who claim to know God and are thriving in sin, all kinds of sinful behavior, were practically telling lies. lies. Mm -hmm. And this means that since we all call ourselves Christians and we now find God's commandment hard to keep, it means that we are also lying. Because St. John also writes that for those who really know God, that they already have the commandments in their hearts. So this means that we should try our best to not only um, know the commandments by in our mind and memorize it, but also have it in our heart and practice it. Ha ha. There's a difference between having it in the mind and having it in the heart, isn't it? Yes. If it is in the heart, it is out of the abundance of the heart. Speak it. Uh -huh. But if it is only in the mind, it may be in the mind and it may not come out. Yes, right. Isn't it? But what is in the heart easily comes, comes out. out. So your what is your advice to us Nigerian Christians? I uh, should try our best to know the commandments in our heart so that we may practice it and become and know God truly. We should let the commandments descend from the head to our hearts. Yes. Help me tell them to say so. We should let the commandments descend from our head to our hearts. Because if it is in our hearts. Because if it is in our hearts. It will usher out in behavior. It will usher out in behavior. Because people normally. Because people normally. Live out what is in their hearts. Live out what is in their hearts. Notwithstanding what is in their head. Notwithstanding what is in their head. Clap for us. Yes, Dominic. I want to answer question. Three. Why I think the disciples found it difficult to recognize Jesus soon after the resurrection? Because they did not believe the scriptures. Because they did not believe the scriptures. Precisely the answer, the, what Jesus told them. Because they didn't believe the scriptures. Give him, give him a round of applause. Yes. And because they did not have faith. Because they didn't have faith, yes. Because Saint Augustine said that faith is believing what you do not see. Faith is believing what you do not see. Even the scriptures, Hebrew says that too. Yes. Give, you know about Saint Augustine. Give him a round of applause, Joe. You may you may be the next to win an encyclopedia. And what finally helped them to recognize him was well, after Jesus put understanding in their mind. After Jesus Christ put understanding in them. Yes. And also because they saw him. Because they saw his hands and his legs. They saw his wounds. Give him an applause. A huge applause. Because they saw his wounds. The wounds in his hands and in his side. Yes. You win. You win. 100%. Okay. I want to answer question two. Okay. The key message of Saint Peter in our first reading is that repent that your sins may be blotted. Repent. Having crucified Jesus on account of your sins, what you should do now is repent. Give her a round of applause. <laughs> who, who is that? What's your name? Agnes. Agnes, yes. I think the principal theme of the readings of today is passing from death into new life. Passing from? Death into new life. Passing from death to new life. From death to new life. Principal. Is that the principal theme? Yes. In your opinion, okay. Because from the readings, right from the first reading, we could see, um, we could see um, in the Acts of the Apostles, um, saying that we... 
Jesus uh, died, Jesus and, died and, and, and rose, rose again. Yes. Then it's the expiation for our sins. So passing from sin into holiness, death into new life. That's what I hmm? think. Sin to holiness, death to life. But I hope you know that that is the theme for the entire seven weeks of Easter. From death to life. Yes. Is the theme for the entire, from Easter Sunday to Pentecost. Yes. That is the theme. So can you think of a theme more fitting for specifically for the third Sunday today? That's what I think. Okay. Give us 60% applause. Yes, Inya. I think for me, the theme is we are witnesses. We are all called to be witnesses. We are witnesses. Or we are called to be witnesses. Give a round of applause. <coughs> One more theme. My own principal theme for today is Christ's gift of peace. Because St. Peter's homily, his sermon, indicates that the only thing you require if you want peace, the people who came to listen to St. Peter, the 500 of them, they were touched to heart. And they say, so what do we do, brothers? Repent. And believe Jesus. That's the only way for you to have peace. And when it, Jesus now appeared to his disciples. Each time he said. Peace be with you. So even the ones who betrayed him. Everybody. His gift to them when he appeared was. So my own principal theme is. Christ's gift of peace. They were wounded by guilt. The disciples were wounded by guilt. Part of the reason why they didn't recognize him is that they were blinded by their guilt. On account of their infidelity, on account of their disbelief, their cowardice, their betrayal, they couldn't see clearly. They were also wounded by fear and anxiety and doubt and disappointment and grief and despair. You see, when people give in to these emotions, uh, these are all negative emotions, isn't it? And psychologists today know that these negative emotions don't help people. They lead people into towards destruction. Fear. Fear that I constantly say fear is the dominant um, condition in this country. The reason why charlatans and so-called men of God and women of God are leading so many people astray is because of fear. The person already has fear, a dose of fear in him or her. If, for example, some dubious person says, let me see your palm. And you show your palm and he looks at the lights in the palm and says, ah, Upari, they have finished you. It is not then that the fear is put in the person. Is it that time? The fear was already there. You are already living in fear. And the person actually only capitalized on the fear. Anxiety. Common denominator in this country. Anxiety. You can see the anxiety with, in the way people drive. The graphic example is the way people drive. The anxiety. The agitation all over the place. Too much anxiety. And I keep saying that a mark of a godly person is calmness. 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 Look at all the holy men and women in history. Look at all the sages in history of both Christianity and other religions. They were calm. They were mellow. Our agitation is evidence that we don't know God. What did I say? Our excessive agitation is evidence that we do not know God. We are only lying. Because calmness of soul, mellowness of spirit is a principal feature of a godly person. But the disciples were anxious, they were doubtful, they were disappointed, they were in grief. You remember the case of last Sunday? Thomas was in such grief that he did not come to join the other disciples. So he lost one week of joy, as I said. They were in despair. These negative emotions will not allow any of us to see Jesus, to recognize him. Their unity was broken. Judas had committed suicide, you remember? And Thomas, in his crisis of faith, had isolated himself. 
in their guilt and in their fear they erected barriers around themselves we were told that they were locked up in the upper room they, were, they did not only erect barriers around themselves in the physical realm, they also erected barriers around themselves in the spiritual and psychological realm. They were barricaded as it were. But Jesus broke through all these barriers. Jesus broke through the physical barriers. He also broke through the emotional barriers and the psychological barriers. I hope you understand what I mean by psychological and emotional barriers. We do erect barriers around ourselves on an emotional and psychological level, making it difficult for people to come in, making it difficult for God to come in. Jesus broke through these barriers and he stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. Jesus did not school them. This is where the example of compassion and forgiveness and mercy that Jesus had this supreme example. Just as on the cross of Calvary, he looked at those who crucified him and said, Lord, forgive them for they know what, not what they do. Jesus did not school them for their infidelity. And that is strange. And those are the strange ways of God. He did not blame them for deserting him. He did not recriminate them for their cowardice. He did not condemn them for betraying him. He did not become embittered as many of us would be because of the wounds he carried. He still carried the scars of those wounds. But he was not bitter. In the most critical moment of crisis among his disciples. When they were wounded in heart and wounded in spirit. When everything looked dark and gloomy. When they had lost all hope and they were on the verge of despair. Take note. Jesus' appearance brought the disciples what they desperately needed. Those who have experienced God and have journeyed with God, they are able to testify that at the most desperate, difficult situation point in your life, when all seems lost, that is when the Lord shows his power. When it appears that all is gone, that is when the power of God shines forth. This is what St. Paul meant when he said that God's power is at work at its best in weakness. It is at its best. So, is there any of you who think that you are getting to, to the verge of of despair is there any of you here is there any of you who thinks that it is uh, i have tried and tried I, I, i'm not winning is there any of you rejoice and be glad and take note just look well jesus is standing there and he's saying what peace be with you claim it claim that peace because at that very point when with human beings by human reckoning all is lost who is there jesus is there and what kind of words does he pronounce peace be with you those words are gentle those words are calm those words are reassuring all he said he didn't make long speech all he said was peace be with you in this brief message of peace you know Jesus forgive their sins. You don't do peace be with you for somebody that you are quarreling with, do you? Right? Somebody that you are angry with, you are mad with, you don't say peace be with you. Peace be with you means you are a friend. I accept you in spite of everything. Peace be with you. And you know one of the lies we tell, you know we tell many lies. One of the lies we tell is also that during kiss of peace, husband and wife here so that we may not see them and say these people didn't shake hand so we say offer we are ready to receive the body of christ together from the same bowl we say offer each other a sign of peace 
and somebody does it. What is that hand doing? What is that hand doing? Telling lies. That hand is telling lies. Because it's supposed to be a symbol of what? Peace be with you. But inside the heart, there is venom. So when it does like this, and some people to emphasize it, you know what they do? They don't give the full thing. They don't give all the fingers. <laughs> eh? Just to show that this my peace. There is a reserve. <laughs> but Jesus forgave their sins in that single statement. Peace be with you. He healed their wounds. He calmed their fears. He gave them what reassurance. In that brief message, peace be with you, Jesus gave them a new reason to live. I mean, it would have been better the day you are quarreling with your wife or your husband. Let somebody sit between the two of you so that you don't have... <laughs> eh? But my hope is that by the time we get to that point, luckily they put that point towards the end, isn't it? That by the time we get to that point, all the venom would have gone. In Jesus' name. Uh, so you say, um, our quarrel is over. Peace be with you. Our quarrel is over. Peace be with you. Sometimes one person does that and the other does like this. To say, no, my own is not yet over. But my hope is that actually when people come to church, in order that we may not tell the kind of lie St. John is talking about, that when people come to church, you know, Jesus Christ, if you are bringing an offering to the altar and you remember that somebody has something against you, not that you have something against somebody, but that somebody has something against you, leave your offering at the door. Go reconcile with the person first. I would like to see many cases where husband and wife reach the door and instead of stepping in, they say, Mbo, I beg, come. Uh, that thing that happened on Monday, uh, let's finish it before we enter. So that we may not tell a lie in church. We would like to see that, isn't it? And we can actually tell hospitality ministers that when people are entering, ask them, husband and wife especially, ask them, uh, uh, is, <laughs> is everything okay? Is everything okay? Would both of you be able to shake yourselves very well in all sincerity? Uh, Sim, can you people do that when people are entering? Just ask them, uh, is everything okay? Are you sure everything is okay? Uh, you are laughing. Would that not be a Christian thing to do? In that brief statement, Jesus gave them a new reason to live. He gave them new courage. He fired them up with new hope. So, from utter hopelessness and failure, something totally new emerged with the risen Lord. Amen? Amen. From utter hopelessness and failure, something totally new emerged in the risen Christ. When all seemed to have ended in defeat and humiliation, Jesus brought something refreshingly new. What is it? Shalom. Peace. Jesus' shalom, Jesus' peace be with you means what? It is I, not me. It is I. Next. So don't be afraid. Next. I am alive. Next. I have been vindicated and I have conquered death and I have shamed the devil and I have overcome the world and I am in control. So that short shalom, that short peace be with you is saying all this. Peace, it is I. Peace, don't be afraid. Peace, I am alive. Peace, I have been vindicated. Peace, I have conquered death. Peace, I have shamed the devil. Peace, I have overcome the world. Peace, you know what? I am in control. Jesus' peace be with you means, you know, sin has been overthrown. Darkness has been dislodged. Truth has prevailed. Love has triumphed over hate. Life is stronger than death. Yes. You see, I am here. What my being here means is 
Life is stronger than death. The agents of darkness shall not have the last laugh. And you know, these are things for us to be reciting every day to ourselves, you know. Every day we need to be reciting these things to ourselves. We assure ourselves that Jesus says, I am here, I am alive, even in the deepest darkness. Don't we recite in Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, even if I walk in the depth of darkness, I shall not fear because you are there with your crook and your staff. Now, to now say, sin has been overthrown. Darkness has been dislodged. So even as you are struggling with sin in your life, you are struggling with this element of sin or that element, you wake up each day and you say, in my life today, sin has been overthrown. But you see, when you say that, in my life today, sin has been overthrown, you have to conduct yourself from that moment in a manner that you don't return to that sin. You can't be celebrating the overthrow of sin and be walking towards that sin. Truth has prevailed. Love has triumphed over hate. Life is stronger than death. The agents of darkness shall not have the last love. So, Jesus' peace be with you means a new world is possible. This world, you know, what we call in this country, the Nigerian factor. No, a new Nigeria is possible. Amen? Amen? A new Nigeria is possible. Let none of us ever be saying that kind of nonsense, the Nigerian factor. Who makes it a factor? We, it is we that make it a factor. We make corruption a factor. We make cutting corners a factor. We make indiscipline a factor. But we can remove it. We can remove that factor. We can envision a new Nigeria where things work, where people are truthful, where people do their work, I was sharing with somebody how um, we went through a process for the accreditation of our program, accreditation of our master's program in, in, in Nairobi, Kenya, and that we didn't need to see anybody. When they came for accreditation, we didn't need to cook food for them. They did their work professionally and awarded marks and went didn't need to see nobody and i am told that to get course accreditation in this country you need to see people and i'm like who did that who put that factor we put that factor and we can remove that factor A new humanity is now possible. A new life is now possible. A new day has done. Risen because Jesus has risen from the dead. Because Jesus has risen from the dead, he now tells us what was impossible is now possible. Nobody ever rose from the dead before. Now he has risen from the dead. Therefore, what was not possible is now possible. Calvary has been conquered. So the most difficult problem we have in this society compare it to Calvary. If Calvary was conquered, the most difficult problem can be whether it be uh, uh, sorting or 419 or ethnic bigotry. We can call them Calvary. Calvary has been conquered in Jesus. When the reason Christ pronounced peace on his disciples, he meant there is now hope for all of us. All of us who are wounded by sin. And unfortunately, most of the people I have in front of me are wounded by sin. Unfortunately, we are all wounded by sin. But the good news is that there is hope for all of us. All of us who are broken by betrayal, disappointment, rejection, loneliness, persecution. You see, there are people who suffer betrayals who suffer disappointments there are wives who suffer betrayal by their husbands there are girlfriends who suffer betrayal from boyfriends there are children who suffer rejection from parents there are people who suffer loneliness and you know what they stay there for the rest of their lives 
Do you know what I mean by they stayed there? Oh, you don't understand. They remain at that point of betrayal, at that point of disappointment for the rest of their life. They never leave that point. I hope you know that that's the major problem in the society. That many people are wounded and refuse to leave the point of the woundedness. That's why I say that if they should serve papers to everyone now to do psychological assessment, many of you are candidates, many people are candidates for the mental hospital. Because many people who were wounded have refused to leave the point of woundedness. Jesus says, come, you were wounded, but I am alive. You can now move on. You say, no, it did, they did this to me. It did this to me. When? 25 years ago. So, for 25 years, you have stayed at one point. If I am to serve you guys, assessment, and it is not me who will do it, you are the one that will fill the form. You will fill the questionnaire, and you will discover that you fail yourselves. Many people are going around carrying burdens they should not carry. Whereas the Lord says, come on to me, all you who labor and are overburdened, and I will give you rest. Why do you suffer in vain? Why do you cry in vain when I am there? And I will give you rest. Shoulder my yoke and learn from me that I am humble and gentle in heart and I will give you rest. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light and you will find rest for your souls and I will give you rest. So come on to me, all you who labor and are overburdened and I will give you so I challenge you today my sisters and brothers those of you who are disappointment who are disappointed by a boyfriend 30 years ago hmm? and you are still there at that point some went ahead and married another person I managed that person for the last 30 years. But they are still where they were when the first boyfriend disappointed them. I hope you know there are many such cases. Aha. The Lord is saying, leave that place. 20 years have passed. 30 years have passed. Don't remain at that point. You know what often happens is that people then go through life and they have never lived since that point. And it's a pity. It's a horrible situation. But many people are like that. People who were wounded by betrayal, who have decided that on account of this betrayal, I am not going to move on. That is where I am going to remain. People who are disappointed, they have been let down by their spouses or parents or whatever, and have decided to remain there. What experts see when people go to, to, to consult counselors and psychologists is amazing. Somebody is 50 years old and the reason why he has decided not to move on is that when he was 5 years old his father did this to him. And he is now 50 years old he has decided that that is where he will remain. Eh, because my father did this to me. Eh, I'm justified to remain there because my father did this to me. The Lord is saying move on. Peace be with you. Look at what you did to me but I have moved on. You have no reason to remain there all those who are humiliated by poverty failure in business failure in politics unemployment homelessness sickness and disease jesus christ says you can move on because i am alive peace be with you all those who are confronted with failure in marriage and in family life with problem spouses with problem children or with childlessness he says, no, don't remain there. You can move on. Your life is more than the problem. I have overcome the world. A new life is possible. A new humanity is possible. A new joy is possible for you. You can move on. Peace be with you.
All those who are victims of the widespread violence in our land. Whether it is the headsman violence or the crime all over the place. If we survived it, you can actually become stronger on account of that. Every adversity that faces us, we are meant to rise from it stronger. If we die from it, we won't be here to discuss it, right? But if you are alive, if you survive it, you can be stronger on account of that adversity. And like I said, no Christian should ever have to suffer in vain. Like the disciples, we too are often wounded in many ways. We often go through many struggles. And we often endure many pains. We are often not what we ought to be. Right? Is there anyone here who is what he or she ought to be? Like it is said, we are imperfect, but we are perfectible. Can we say that together? We can be better than we are now. In fact, much better than we are now. You know, I said to you guys that before me, I check out of this world. I will be talking like this. You will be seeing a halo around my head. Oh yes. In Jesus name. Amen. I will be better. Uh, not just like I can. I will be better than I am now. As long as God lives. I will be better than I am. Each one of us can be better than we are. Easter may not take away all our pains. It often does not. But it gives our pains what? Meaning. New meaning. Easter does not take away all our pains, but it does what? It lights them up with new hope. Jesus' appearance endows us with a quality of peace different from that which the world can give. The kind of peace that St. Paul says to the Philippians, the peace that surpasses understanding. Philippians 4, 7. So, Jesus says, is the peace the world cannot give. For John 14, 27. So we can claim his lasting peace even in a mist. Please take notes. There are those who say that the way Jesus Christ gives peace is by removing all your troubles. That's not what I have read in the Gospels. That's not what I have read in the New Testament. What I have read in the New Testament is the kind of peace that surpasses understanding. That no people around who see the mountain of problems we have will be wondering why is this person at peace? You can't understand because of the Christ in me who has conquered all. So the peace of Christ is a peace that comes in spite notwithstanding The peace of Christ does not wait until all problems are solved. Otherwise, it means until the new heavens and the new earth are established, it means we can't have peace. Isn't it? But the peace of Christ comes nevertheless. It comes even in the midst of what? Social turbulence and turmoil. In spite of widespread criminality and terrorist insurgency. In spite of political and social instability, economic distress, sickness and disease, tension at work, crisis in marriage. Forgiveness, victory over evil and peace are available to all who repent and believe in the risen Christ. That is what St. Peter told those who listened to him. Because Jesus is alive, because he speaks his word of peace, everything has now changed. Our wounds have been healed. Our circumstances are transformed. To enjoy this peace, this new life, this peace that surpasses understanding, we only need to do what? To repent, to be converted, to believe in him, and to claim our peace. The peace of Jesus is the peace of the kingdom. It is a comprehensive peace that includes what? Atonement or atonement with God. Repentance and turning to God. Reconciliation with neighbor. We can't have that peace if we are at war with our neighbor. Wholeness of life. John chapter 10 verse 10. Jesus says, I have come that they may have life and have it more abundantly. Physical, mental, emotional well-being. Then holiness of life. 
moral and spiritual integrity then contentment or fulfillment one of the reasons why we don't have peace is the lack of contentment then material prosperity the peace of jesus is at once a gift jesus says peace be with you but you see that pronunciation of peace or pronouncement of peace you know what it is also a task a command as it were peace be with you it's an endowment but it is also a charge it is an endowment and as well as a mission jesus gives us his peace he also commissions us to go out there and be makers or promoters of peace he says blessed are the peacemakers for they are the ones to be called children of god even in our woundedness even in our woundedness what are your woundedness what are your woundednesses <laughs> what are elements of woundedness in you you have no job well that's one you don't have a, a good enough job for you that's one you have no husband that's one you have no wife wife they plenty now <laughs> you have no children you are looking for bomb boy you get bomb girl <laughs> so whatever your wounded may nest may be jesus makes us agents of healing for others who are hurting around us i hope you know that it is not the one who is hurting the most that is most um miserable i hope you know that some of those hurting the most are the ones going around the whole place healing people i hope you know so when you sit down and you are lamenting and you are bemoaning because you think you are carrying the problems of the world your own are the most there are people whose problems are worse than your own who are going around helping others and actually your problems will be less if you know how to go around helping others who are wounded how many people have experience in this that when you go out in your woundedness when you go out trying to help others to heal your own wounds get healed because the happiness of Christ is a happiness that comes on account of wanting to make other people happy. But you know what? We cheat ourselves. We cheat ourselves because constantly we are trying to say, mm, leave me. I, I, want, I just want my own happiness. All I want now is my own happiness. My own happiness. You know, go get them. As long as what you are pursuing is your own happiness, I assure you, no because, I assure you, you will not find it. But when you are determined to make others happy, you will be happy that is that is age old wisdom and jesus christ himself said it taught us we are wounded healers every one of us is equipped to be a wounded healer the early disciples turned their experience of the resurrection into a new program of life so peace be with you that jesus pronounced is a program of life they turn it into a program of life spreading the good news of salvation everywhere as powerful witnesses of jesus after celebrating easter you need to ask yourself what is your own program of life after celebrating easter how are you being a witness of jesus today how are you being a wounded healer how in spite of your own wounds how are you stretching out to heal others like i said just now if you are not engaged passionately engaged in wanting to heal others of their woundedness you won't easily find healing for your own now cause are the cause i am only making a statement of fact that the easiest way to find healing for your own wounds is to be actively engaged putting your energy and resources into helping other people heal of their woundedness then the lord heals your own that is the part of the peace that surpasses understanding 
And we need to not only know this for ourselves and take it seriously for ourselves, we need to teach it to our people. Because part of the factor, the Nigerian factor we are rejecting, part of that factor is me, myself, I. Everything for me, for myself, for I. As long as we are so circled in, barricaded, and our concerns are all about me, and about myself, and about I, we can't find peace. So please go out after this mass and go and help heal people by helping them liberate themselves from the barricades of selfishness and self-centeredness so that they may have happiness and joy. Our country will continue to be like this until we conquer that demon of self-centeredness. We will continue like this. It is only when we now start getting concerned about the other person and reaching out to the other person, making life better for the other person, that is when our own life will be better now. You know, talking about reaching out to help other people to make our life better. In the midst of insecurity, widespread insecurity, all people do is to build taller fences and stronger barbed wires and electrified fences. FCT has a is it 1.5 meters that fence is supposed to be, right? The 1.5 meters fence is supposed to enable neighbors to look in to be able to see the, the houses of everyone. But you know what the rich ones among us do? They have a 3 meter fence. 3 meter fence. Some these days are making it concrete, not blocks anymore, concrete. And then after the 3 meter fence, you have... Um, Yes, barbed wire that is rolled in. And after that, you now have electric whatever. Now, all I am going to say to you is that we will be needing more and more and more of that as long as we are not concerned about our neighbor. If we are concerned about our neighbor, it is our neighbor that will ensure our security. I must have told you about about Archbishop Kwashi, Anglican Bishop of Joss, who suffered serious violence. His wife was brutalized seriously during one of those Joss crises. And after that, she said, if she had some of this Almajiri, some of these jobless um, people, if she had adopted a number of them in her house, she might not have suffered this. She decided to open her house up and pick these people who are roaming on the streets and adopt a number of the children. Because she said, if I had a number of them in the house, when this, their colleagues came, they would have been the ones to defend me. Now she has hundreds of those people that she has raised and she continues to raise and she is secure. We all need to know that our security is in the welfare of the people around us. Amen? Amen. Our security, our highest security is in the welfare of the poor around us. By, we think it is by strong fences. Do fences. After concrete, it will be iron. Fences. Then we say our roads are bad. And you know what our big people do? You go and buy big SUV. I went to preach retreat in Adoekiti. And I traveled in one of the worst roads in the country. The road between Kaba in Kogi State and Umu in, uh, I will even say Anikole in Ekiti. One of the worst roads in this country. And of course, by the time we entered a few gallops, my car spoiled. I spent the whole week. They spent the whole week repairing the car. I looked at that road and I'm like, do leaders, do any leaders pass here? Say, oh, they told me, yes, they pass, but their jeeps are so heavy <laughs> that my little Toyota, I mean Nissan cannot make it in that, that kind of road, but their jeeps will just go through. Hmm? And when the thing is old, they buy new ones. So, 
the more we see the problem, the more we take care of ourselves and neglect the problem. That's what we do. Yeah. We just take care of ourselves. Oh, there is insecurity. Buy bulletproof cars. There is insecurity. Surround the big people surround themselves with police with police and kill and go police and then you know. That is not how a society progresses. Because you can only protect yourself to a certain extent. After some time, you will be overwhelmed. The best way to protect yourself is to take care of the needs of everyone. Can we say that together? A situation where the leaders of our society can no longer take a stroll to the market. It's a bad situation, isn't it? Those of you who are politicians or aspiring politicians, how can you be a leader of your people? Can you imagine now me, your priest, cannot take a stroll around your estate to come and visit you? How can you be a leader of your people and you cannot take a stroll around the marketplace in the place that you are representing? How? What kind of leader is that? You are only a conqueror. If you need kill and go, bulala, bulala wielding kill and go, gun totting kill and go, to drive around your constituency, you are a conqueror, you are not a leader. That's not leadership. Yes, there is insecurity. You should spend yourself trying to see how to provide employment, how to improve security for everyone. And not just to secure yourself. That's not what leadership is all about. So, what do we do after Easter? What is our program of life? What is the program of life of leaders who are Christian in our society? Just carry on business as usual? No. How are you being a witness of the risen Lord today? One would have expected the risen Lord to be without blemish. You know, the wounds he showed. But this did not happen. The risen Christ still carried what? Scars of the wounds caused by humiliation and torture and crucifixion. It was the scars that helped the disciples to recognize him. It was the scars of the wounds that brought healing to their own wounds. The scars of Jesus, when they saw it, one, it helped them to recognize him. Two, it brought healing. That's why we say, by his wounds we are healed. By his stripes we are made whole. Jesus' wounds are proof of his immense love for us. Jesus' wounds are source of hope as we nurse our own wounds. Showing the scars in his hands and his feet, Jesus says what? Can you read? See my wounded hands and feet. Doubt no longer but believe. Again he says, see the wounds I endured for your sins. Go and sin no more. In Jesus, the wounds and the scars we endure on account of love or service of our fellow men and women are nothing to be ashamed of. The fact that you incur wounds, you sustain wounds on account of loving your husband or loving your wife, that is normal. That is normal. You know, I keep saying here that hearts are meant to be <laughs> hearts that cannot be broken are stone. But hearts are not made of stone. They are made of flesh. So if you, will, you sustain wounds in the process of loving your husband, of course, yes, because that's what you are going to show. That's the badge you are going to show tomorrow before God that you loved or not. So the wounds we sustain, the scars of the wounds we sustain, they are nothing to be ashamed of if indeed we are doing the will of God. They become badges of honor. You know what badges of honor are? When soldier go to war and did wonderfully well, they will give a badge of honor. The wounds we sustain in the process of loving, they are badges of honor. I told you that love and suffering, they go together, isn't it? If you really love, you will suffer. The one who doesn't want to suffer has no capacity to love. God is proud of us on account of these wounds. In those wounds, we resemble his son. Bishop Honor said in the, in the discussion I had with him on video, Bishop Honor said something. He said the devil many times pretends to be Jesus and appears as Jesus. The devil many times appears as Jesus, but the devil never appears as Jesus on the cross. Did, did, did you get that point? 
the devil pretends to be Jesus, appears as Jesus many times. But the devil never appears as Jesus on the cross. Why? Because it was on the cross that the devil was conquered. That's why when people reject the cross, they don't know what they are doing. Jesus can, I mean, the devil can appear as Jesus multiplying loaves. The devil can appear as Jesus walking on water. The devil can appear as Jesus doing all kinds of fantastic things, but the devil never appears as Jesus on the cross of Calvary or with the wounds of Jesus. Never. Hmm. I mean, in our society, all kinds of things happen. The devil can appear like Jesus, as if he's Jesus, but never, never in the symbolism of the crucified one, because that is the symbolism with which he was conquered. That is the place of suffering. That is what suffering can do. Suffering on account of love. Mother Teresa admonishes us. She says what? Love until it hurts. For until it really hurts. All claims to love are mere wayo. <laughs> all claims to love are mere pretensions. Those who love and care enough about others. They do pick up a lot of wounds. Any of you who has experience in really loving, there are a few people who have really loved, isn't it? There are people, a lot of people who have pretended to have loved. But there are only a few people who have really loved. Those who have really loved, if there is any among you, they would have picked up a lot of wounds. They may be visible wounds or they may be invisible wounds. They may be wounds of anxiety and worry and hardship or they may be emotional wounds, wounds that pierce the heart. Betrayal, ingratitude, infidelity, and disappointment. When on the last day we are face to face with God, the critical question may be, can we read it? Did you love me sufficiently? Did you love your neighbor sufficiently? Then show me your scars. Which scars? The evidence of your wounds. If you have no scars to show, then most likely you are only lying. You have never loved Let me end with a poem I call Vulnerability. The cost of love is stupendous. The stakes are high. The price of loving is enormous. The risks are too great to ignore. To undertake a journey of love is to undertake a huge investment with no insurance cover. We hear the expression, I love you, I love you, I love you. So often. But what does it mean? When a mother says I love you to her disabled child, what does it mean? When a man visits his sick wife in the hospital and says I love you, what does it mean? When Jesus says to his disciples and to us I love you, what does it mean? It means the cross. It means sweat. It means blood. It means pain. It means tears. It means death. To love means to give life in a world that is dying. We often reduce the meaning of love to some sweet, harmless thing. To some sensual feeling of goodness and pleasure. But the word love is always cross-shaped. It comes in the form of a cross. That is why Christ says that the proof of love is that a man lays down his life for his friend. Is this not the reason why we often refuse to love? Is this not the reason why we often refuse to get involved? We run away from the risks and the costs which go with the life-giving mystery of love. We run away from the tears and the pain which are unavoidable. In the divine project of love, we often rationalize and say there is a limit to everything. But love is not a project of the head. Love is something of the heart. To love is to triumph over all fear. To love is to do something victorious. To love is to do something glorious. To love is to conquer death and to live to the full. Scripture passages for our reflection. Read about the promised Messiah in Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6 and following. 
I leave you peace, my peace I give you, the peace the world cannot give. In John chapter 14, verse 27, peace be with you. See the number of places that Jesus spoke these words when he rose from the dead. John 20, 19, 20, 21, 20, 26, and Luke 24, 36. In the world you will face all kinds of trouble, Jesus says, but do not be afraid. I have overcome the world. And Jesus says to us in the Beatitudes, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called children of God. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We praise you. We glorify your holy name. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for the transformation you brought to the world on account of the resurrection of Jesus. Thank you that you love the world so much that you bore the wound the woundedness of seeing your only begotten son die on the cross for us. What shows God's love is that while we were yet sinners, St. Paul says, Christ died for us. Lord, we thank you. We glorify your holy name. We honor you. As we continue to celebrate Easter, the resurrection of Christ, Lord, send us out with your spirit. Send us out with your graces that we may be like Peter and John, witnesses of the resurrection. That we may be witnesses of that gift of peace. That we may stretch our hands and extend that peace to our brothers and sisters. That we may minister that peace in the form of service, especially to our neighbors and our friends and our family members. Lord, help us to embrace that peace today as a gift, but also as a task. Help us to be agents of peace in the world and in our society through Christ our Lord.